funny thing. We like to highlight glorious successes, how the greatest genius in the nation teams up with the full weight of government resources to make a spectacular device which breaks the limits of what once held as possible and paves the way to a new era in human history. But for every glorious success, there are a thousand ignoble failures. And sometimes an attempt at technological innovation comes in the form of a bunch of fringe weirdos from a failing nation getting themselves killed three times over in an attempt to make a submarine. Welcome to No One is Competent, the premier history podcast showing off the bunglings and follies of history. I'm Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host Azalea. This show comes with no sponsors or advertisements, and thus we appreciate our listeners telling their friends about the podcast as well as rating and reviewing it on whatever podcasting app they're on. You can find Jay on Twitter at jharis48, and you can find me on Twitter at Azalea Wyatt. If you have any podcast suggestions or requests, or you just want to contact us about, contact us about anything, you can find us at nooneiscompetent at gmail.com, and our music is done by the glorious Sam Bryce. Speaking of glorious, this is a... This, I'm I'm feeling good today doing this podcast episode. How how are you feeling today? How Jay? How how does how does episode twenty six find you? Uh, pretty well. I mean, I've been a bit busy lately, which actually means that uh, this episode is is very much your baby, not mine. Um, yes, yes, yes. You know, some you know things happen. You know, things like a guy totally you know miscalibrating their commitment to <laughs> the con they're going to attend on a weekend, and thus having to push around workload and telling me that I have to write a podcast episode in two days I didn't expect to do, and maybe this podcast episode is going to suck for that. I, I don't know. You're gonna, Our listeners are going to have to decide whether or not this one's going to suck. But, yes, let it be known on the tin. This is the rare Azalea episode, and that means that, th- you know, things might go a little off the rails uh, into the ocean and in- into the bottom of the sea. Uh sometimes of uh, the course this episode uh this was actually i believe this was on the short list when we conceptualize this podcast like i have wanted to do this one from the jump and and i'm glad that i did get the chance to do it because... yeah this, this has been i think always something that you not not to say that i was not interested in the subject i mean i'm sure most of our listeners by now know that i love naval history but this specific episode in naval history is something which I feel like you have a lot of interest in. Yes, I actually am a big Civil War naval nerd, specifically. Uh, in ninth grade, I was assigned to do a project on naval warfare for my... Uh, um, I was in Injero TC. Uh, in a different life and I was sup- much better at it than the listeners of this podcast would assume that I was but uh, and uh, if you don't know what NJROTC is uh, it's like uh, American uh, Hitler youth uh, but naval themed uh, anyway it's not gonna uh, make I had to angry. do I had to do a project on, uh, I mean, listen, I was a operations officer, uh, cadet lieutenant, third highest ranked person in the unit. So I am roasting myself when I say that. <laughs> I, the, you know, they say always punch up, but also always punch yourself. Those are the two rules of comedy. As long as you're doing one of those, I think you're fine. Uh, anyway... I had to do a um, uh, project on the battle of the the Monitor versus the Merrimack, Hampton Roads, and I ended up uh, essentially like after my formal presentation, just going on like a super long rant that like a, a just giant autistic scream that eventually the teacher had uh, had had to just like hold just to tell me to stop. <laughs> it was like you're you're done now. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I, I, I find, um, J- I mean, Jay has me outgunned in naval history, uh, nerd cred, but that does not mean I am not a naval history nerd. 
Uh, I yeah. just also have other obsessions, uh, and you are you are a strong boy. Uh, this this one's gonna be fun. Our story today is that of the H. L. Hunley, an ill-conceived death strap of a machine that drowned twenty-one Confederate soldiers in somewhat hilarious fashions. Now, uh, a lot of this episode was compiled just from my memory and the bit of you know, Wikipedia. Uh, I did throw this one together in uh, two days, so uh, you, you know it's, it's gonna. Okay, so researching the Hunley is a bit fraught, as it is both a Civil War topic and represents an experimental turn in technology. It's also in this weird, like, gray zone in academia where it's a thing a lot of people know about, and it's a thing that a decent amount of people have studied, but it's not a thing that's, like, super, super, super well-known. Like, on all of the tests, well-known. So... There's a lot of sources of varying quality from stuff that's basically for kids or propaganda or to, you know, actual academic uh, uh, treats. Of course, because it's, you know, Civil War, you'll find a lot of sources coloring their accounts of a lot of biased romance and unnecessary drama and politics. I tried to stay objective, but uh, the sources that I used, I was didn't have the time to vet them as, as much as I want, and I drew heavily from the book Secrets of a Civil War Submarine by Sally M. Walker and the article Confederate Submarine H.L. Hunley, written by William Floyd Jr. for Warfare History Network. Uh, I also checked certain details against the Hunley Museum website, uh, combed for a bunch of articles, found a surprising amount of conflicting information, uh, because, you know, this did happen 150 years ago, and... Uh, there are, there's only so many sources we have, but I did it quickly. It's probably wrong, but listen, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. You're going to be entertained. Uh, I, I think our, our, our podcast listeners, uh, will be very, uh, satisfied, uh, about the Hunley, but before we, the Hunley, we got to do context jay give us some context that was written by me azalea and it contains <laughs> all of the uh azalea uh political biases and opinions all right well you know our story takes place during the american civil war here in the states we generally just call it the civil war with no modifiers because we're more important than anybody else and they can go shove it now, as I'm sure many of our listeners do not know what the United States is, or why it has a civil war, I figure I should explain it really quick. We skipped doing this during our Reconstruction episode because we didn't have the time, but considering this episode is a good bit shorter, we decided to put it here, and by we decided, I mean Azalea wants to rant. In the 16th and 17th centuries, white Europeans began colonizing the eastern seaboard of North America, driving out the indigenous population weakened by foreign disease and internal conflicts. This is done by Spanish, English, Scottish, Swedes, French, and Dutch, but by the 1770s most of the eastern seaboard was under the dominion of the United Kingdom. By this time, these American colonies had existed for over a hundred years, and had developed an economic system, government, and culture independent from the British government, and were beginning to see themselves as independent people. So yeah, they revolted in 1775. The American Revolution is incredibly dope, and surprisingly based, founded on the principles of tax evasion, police abolition, and being able to smoke as much drugs into the country as one wanted. It was a popular uprising from the lower classes who yearned for freedom and autonomy. Unfortunately, when it came time for these people to form a new government, the process was hijacked by a bunch of inbred aristocrats, gluttonous slavers, megalomaniac poli brats, and pompous lawyers. So many poli brats. <laughs> like, let, 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 let's be real now. If Thomas Jefferson existed today, he would be a fucking lanyard-wearing uh, DC think tank brat who totally had the perfect plan to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict or, or whatever, yeah. okay? <laughs> he would be insufferable. Uh, yeah. As would Madison, as would Hamilton. They, I mean, 
they all hated each other at the time. They, they were insufferable then. Their uh, Twitter yeah, accounts would, have been, would have been pretty awful. Oh, I don't know. I might enjoy Hamilton on Twitter. Hamilton might have had a pretty, pretty all right Twitter. I feel like Franklin would be the best on Twitter. Oh, yeah, but Franklin would only post, like, once every, like, two weeks or so. Like, it would yeah. be a long time before, you know, Fr- Franklin would be the drill of his day. Oh, so I guess, like, he didn't actually do much when he came to forming the new government. No, no, no. Fr- Franklin is, like, the ideal uh, founding father because, like, he's able to stand for shit without, like, actually doing anything and, ha- and getting any blame for, for how stupid the American government came out. Yeah. Like, Madison and Hamilton get, like, you, you know, you have to give it to them. They did the work. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we can blame them, and we do. But uh, they, they did actually do the work to bang out how this whole thing was going to work. And, you know, we can rant about, you know, how cool Thomas Paine was and whatnot, but he wasn't the guy writing the document. I like Thomas Paine, but yeah, very much sidelined yeah, yeah. by American society. <laughs> I, and also addendum, Thomas Paine w- would have had the most fire Twitter. Would have gotten banned. Yes. Would have gotten banned <laughs> almost immediately, but it would have been fire. Uh, shout outs for having a, a, a funeral attended by only like, seven people because you are so virulent in how much you hate Christianity. Uh, and, and by the time you are dead, everyone despises you. Uh, gotta respect it. Anyway, when it kind anyway, when it came time to bang out a government, this ruling class of America eventually came up with the United States constitution in 1789. Now, if you judge the American constitution, in the context of it being, like, the first document of its kind, it's a very impressive work. If you judge it by any other standard, it is laughably stupid, poorly written document that sets up a shambling government full of contradictions and failures that essentially made a civil war completely inevitable. Why did this happen? Well, the American Revolution was not done by a single people, but instead by an alliance of colonies uniting together against an imperial master. The peoples of Maryland, Vermont, the Carolinas, New York, and so forth didn't really consider themselves to be one people or to have much in common. They contained peoples of varying ethnicities and religious principles, and in the early days even fought amongst themselves for territory. When representatives from these 13 colonies all got in the room to hash out the Constitution, it was far from a foregone conclusion that they would form a single government. They constantly threatened to leave the proceedings and there's many timelines where they form two, three, or four countries instead of one. And, you know, that begs the question, why, why was there so much disagreement between them? Well, you see, Jay, the ruling castes of these colonies had highly different economic interests. And also a lot of religious differences. Like, I didn't go into this, but, re- like, there are many states, like, From the top, at least Maryland, Delaware, and Rhode Island are all founded because some dude is having, like, a weird fucking religious thing, and him and his people are just going to go over there and just be annoying over there so we don't have to deal with them. Okay? Like, I'm pretty sure Delaware and Maryland were both founded just so we can have a place to shove all of the Catholics. Yeah. Again, these colonies had different economic interests, especially economic interests of their elites. The northern colonies were founded by religious weirdos and economic opportunists, and by the 1770s had created a society that ran on the trade of finished goods for more basic commodities. Farmers tilled the decent soil of the north for crops which were traded to growing cities and industrial hubs. Their elites were founding large merchant fleets and early textile factories in the largest cities in the seaboard. The southern colonies, on the other hand, were founded by failed gold miners and economic opportunists. They took advantage of the very fertile soil of the south to grow cash crops for export and fueled these operations with slaves imported from western Africa. Their elites sat atop of massive plantations filled with slaves coerced with physical violence. 
These elites had different cultures and economic backgrounds. In order to keep everyone in the club, numerous compromises were made to appease Southern interest groups. You learned about these in school, at least if you get, you know, you're American. The Three-Fifths Compromise, the Electoral College, the Senate, and several other facets of the American government only existed so that the Southern colonies wouldn't take their ball and go home. Which they threatened to do all the time. (laughs) No one was happy with the document that was banged out in three months, and it was manifestly flawed, but it was all they could agree on and no one wanted a war, so the elites decided to go with it without addressing the obvious problem. All of them knew it was never going to work. You can find plenty of private letters between Hamilton, Madison, and whatnot, talking about how like they knew the Electoral College was stupid and how there were plenty of uh, things they disagreed about the document, but they had a deadline, and the deadline came up, and when the deadline came up, everything they could agree on went in the document. And there's a lot of assumptions that, ah, we'll change it later, we have an amendment process, it, it'll be fine, but... Uh, Even though they defended the document in public, privately, every founding father knew that the Constitution was, at a bare minimum, a work in progress. Yeah, and like, you know, we obviously know that the Civil War will begin in 1861, a bit of a spoiler, but sorry. But like, there are numerous events... they wouldn't even make it 80 years (laughs) before all of this fell apart. Yeah, but there are also numerous events... Which is evidence that it was bad. ...but before 1861 that, like, could have caused a civil war or a succession, you know? Oh, definitely. It's definitely possible that, like, if Andrew Jackson wasn't, you know, the (laughs) authoritarian he is, then the U.S. might have fallen apart during his term in office. But anyways... The uh, the yeah, point we're know, trying. If the uh, s- Civil War was about something stupid like states' rights, it would have happened in uh, 1833. Uh, that's when the Civil War would have happened if it was about states' <laughs> rights, which it wasn't. But uh, anyway, moving on. I'm sorry, I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. I enjoy it. Some of these elites figured a new constitution would be written in a few decades, and that would work a lot of these early problems out. They also saw that slavery was on the economic decline at the time and figured that it would eventually fade away. The point we're trying to make is that the United States of America contained two different civilizations within it, and that the extreme compromises of the Constitution worked out none of the tensions. Everyone could see the manifest hypocrisy in founding a nation on freedom whose economy ran on slavery, and this moral tension, along with the competing economic systems, made civil war inevitable. It didn't have to happen in the 1860s, but these people were going to shoot at each other eventually. But the young country soldiered on through the contradictions, and for the first few decades, things were surprisingly fine. Westward expansion provided an outlet for economic growth, kind of a pressure release valve that benefited both economic systems, and a second war with the British brought everyone together. Eventually, though, those old contradictions began to strain the system, especially around the axis of slavery. The entire United States economy was fueled by slavery. The invention of the cotton gin in the early 1800s made southern cotton far more efficient than it was before, and its profitability skyrocketed. This cotton was turned into clothes by the textile mills that formed the background of the northern economy. Everyone in the country benefited from slavery. No one is clean. Fuck you. The North saw a series of religious revivals in the 1800s called the Great Awakening. These spawned new Christian sects obsessed with saving souls and destroying sin, and Southern slavery was an easy target as a sin that needed to be expelled from the country. Also, as the nation grew more and more economically developed in the middle of the 1800s, the North relied less and less on Southern cotton to fuel its economy, which was becoming substantially richer than the South. The South, in turn, grew more and more radical in its pro-slavery views for several reasons. You see, slaves have a tendency to not want to be slaves. A series of uprisings and rebellions took place in the early 1800s. Slaves broke their chains, gathered guns, and fought back against the white oppressors. Southerners put these rebellions down, but became increasingly paranoid about more revolts. 
and grew a paranoid culture that was more and more nervous every year of the people who picked their crops. Secondly, after the import of slaves was banned, the only way to get more slaves was to take advantage of them marrying and selling the resulting kids. For many slave owners, the best way to make money was for them to sell slave children, and increasingly the most valuable thing they owned was their slaves. Abolition meant the ruling class of the South losing a lot of money. Thomas Jefferson, for example, calculated that the slaves and, and selling slaves was the most valuable thing that he owned and the best way for him to make money. And that was in the like 1780s before uh, slave trade got even more profitable. Weirdly enough, stopping like the import of slaves from Africa made slavery a more powerful institution in the United States. That's it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, but it yeah. works if you look at the economics. Thirdly, everyone in the South knew in their bones that slavery was evil. But just like you and me, they wanted to think of themselves as moral, good, religious people. They had to mentally justify what they did. They had to square that circle. And the intellectuals of the South, the scientists, preachers, writers, and politicians, all bent over backwards to come up with reasons why slavery was okay and drowned their children in this propaganda. You can see this in science and, you know, the pseudoscience of phrenology. You know, black people are inferior. Look at their skulls. Uh, you can see this in uh, blatantly uh, incorrect uh, readings of the Bible and highlighting certain uh, phrases about, you know, the children of Ham and whatnot. Uh, and we said slavery got worse and more harsh over time. And as it got more monstrous, this propaganda that they fed to their children and made everybody think that it was okay, it had to get more extreme in turn to justify it. Is kind of, um, shall we say, uh, self-radicalizing like that. Yeah. And finally, the southern method of agriculture was to make these massive plantations that raised cash crops. If the lower classes were going to rise in the ranks, and remember, only the very richest people in the South owned slaves, though certain um, middle class folk kind of rented them out or maybe owned one or two. If those lower classes were going to rise in the ranks, they were going to need more land for their own large plantations. And large, planta large plantations. Come on, mouth. Let's do this. This pushed economic expansion west. They pried Texas away from Mexico and started the Mexican-American War to get even more territory. If you read uh, Southern uh, aristocrats and intellectuals, they, they fully intended, like everyone thought the plan was, to eventually conquer all of Mexico and turn the entirety of Southern North America into uh, slave states as yeah. far as the eye could see. And I mean, you'll even hear like fantasies about, uh, I mean, they weren't fantasies at the time. It was, you know, not totally unreasonable for them to suggest having like a slave empire throughout the Caribbean, you know, just going and taking all those places. They had their eyes on Cuba. They totally had their eyes on Cuba. Yeah. And of course, people are also expanding West in the North and in the North, they want to have small independent farms uh, rather than uh, these large plantations. And the fate of Western territory was a crucial political debate in America at the time. Would Western expansion see small independent white farms in the Northern model or massive slave plantations in the Southern model? The debate over slavery was key to the future of America and everyone knew it. These two groups grew more and more extreme over time, their opposition only making each side more radical. As the 1820s gave way to the 30s and the 40s, more of the nation's controversies began to revolve around slavery. By the 50s, every election and debate was more or less a proxy debate over slavery. It was the er issue. Even when you weren't talking about slavery, you were talking about slavery. Every year, abolition became more popular in the North, and every year, Southerners got more violent and radical to defend their way of life. I, I want to hit on that uh, a little bit, because especially in like my education, I, I was taught a very detailed and I would say relatively good uh, history of like what happened uh, leading up to the Civil War in school. 
but it was always kind of painted that like northerners got more and more uh, abolitionists over time and free black writers ginned up more and more uh, support to end slavery uh, and that's what led to the civil war and we forget that the South also became more radical over time, okay? It was a Southern congressman beating a Northern congressman half to death uh, uh, on the steps of, of, of Congress, uh, not the other way around. They got more aggressive about it. And one of the things that, like, made a lot of Northerners angry, and it's kind of ironic, given that, you know, the South will couch their whole war, especially after the fact, under the guise of states' rights— is, you know, like the act, you know, like the Fugitive Slave Acts, which made it so that essentially northern states, in a way, were forced to kind of give up some sovereignty to the South. Um, and like totally. that made people upset. You know, that made people not like the South. So, yeah, it was very much kind of a, um, a mutual feedback loop of that really could only end up going one place, and that place was war. Now, the question of whether or not new states would be sleeve, sleeve. Now, the question... (laughs) I'm leading that in. I'm leading that into the podcast. (laughs) Fuck you. You can't stop me. The question of whether or not new states would be slave or free eventually turned violent in the case of Kansas, where there were as many as 200 Americans who would die in the fights over this political issue. The political elites of the nation were helpless to stop this escalation. The Democratic Party needed slave states in its coalition to win elections, and all a series of presidents knew how to do was capitulate to the South and kick the can down to the next guy. From Fillmore to Pierce to Buchanan, war only became more inevitable. Yeah, like, if you study the American history of the 40s and the 50s, it is manifestly obvious that war is on the horizon and in some ways you can't even blame the elites for not stopping it because they had no idea how to stop it all they knew how to do was capitulate to the south and uh, try and keep the dance going and by 1860 the bottom fell out of the barrel the democrats were fractured and internally divided on a national level and ran several candidates going into the presidential election This allowed Abraham Lincoln to achieve a plurality. Now, Lincoln was famous across the country for a series of debates he had done opposing the expansion of slavery. He actually really wasn't an abolitionist going into the presidency and didn't have abolitionist intentions, but Southerners expected him to be an abolitionist, and he wasn't even on the ballot in much of the South. His election was all the excuse they needed to succeed. Uh, and, you know, what happens from here, the South fires on Fort Sumpner, Union goes, mobilizes, they go to war, yada, yada, yada. Hopefully this gives you an idea of why the Civil War happened, how the South radicalized, and how the economic structures of the U.S. drove this conflict. Um, on economics, I will say that one of the reasons Civil War happened in the 1860s when it happened was... The North didn't really need the South at that point. Uh, you know, when you learn about the Civil War, if you go to American school, you kind of learn at the start that the North had, you know, way more supplies and resources and railways and whatnot than the South did, and that was part of what heavily influenced the outcome. And, uh, you know, uh, it was hard for the North to subdue the South, but they could do it, and that's one of the reasons they did it. Uh, Southern plantations and cotton is a very bad economic system it uh, did not make them very rich in the long term it was terrible for internal improvements and infrastructure and it was defeated by a more powerful economic system and as a final note uh, americans love to talk about their country was founded on the principles of freedom and to a certain extent it was but it was also founded on the sanctity of private property uh, the u.s government being a thing that exists to make sure that private contracts are enforced and private property is respected. To a lot of Confederates, their war was one to defend their slaves, their private property, and they saw in themselves the true spirit of the American Revolution. Whether or not they were right is up to you. So what we're talking about is a naval battle and a civil war 
And that might raise an eyebrow because we think of the Civil War as a big land-based war. You know, so many famous battles, Antietam, Gettysburg, Bull Run. But the situation at sea set the state for the whole war. Early on, the Union knew that they would have to cut off the Confederacy from the Atlantic Ocean trade, so they moved to blockade the entire coast. This prevented the Confederacy from selling their cotton and cash crops to overseas markets. It also kept them from getting more cash to fuel their war effort and a foreign sponsor that would support them. You know, this was the so-called Anaconda plan to strangle the southern economy with the blockade, and it was highly successful. The Confederate economy basically collapsed, and the lack of supplies was one of the key factors that would lead to their eventual defeat. Now, the Confederacy was never going to beat the American Navy in a straight fight. The Union had their Navy outnumbered more than more than three to one. If they were going to win, they needed to change the meta. The most significant attempt to shake up the game would come in the form of the CSS Virginia, a terrifying Ironside vessel that would briefly punch a hole in the blockade before being halted at the Battle of Hampton Roads. Virginia was a preview of the ships that would dominate naval warfare in the 19th century, an ironclad. It was low to the water and covered with iron plates that were four inches thick at some places. Cannon fire would bounce off of these sloped metal plates, allowing the steam-powered ship to rip through wooden frigates with its 14 guns with little fear of repercussion. It was designed to be an unstoppable wrecking ball. The Virginia was unsuccessful in ending the blockade, but it did prove its superiority over wooden frigates, as it sunk the USS Cumberland and forced the surrender of the USS Congress. After that, it was checked by the Union's own new naval device, the Monitor, and was never able to get another chance at battle. The Confederates couldn't get her seaworthy again before the Union advanced on her home port, and she was scuttled along with the Confederates' best hope of naval victory. Now, the Battle of Hampton Roads was an incredibly important flashpoint of the Civil War that very well could have influenced a different outcome. It involves the most technological advances in naval warfare of the day and is epic and drawn out as two very different combatants fired at each other in a strange duel between different potential paths in naval warfare. It is far too cool and far too dignified to be a subject of this podcast. Instead, our story is that of another nautical military invention, but one which was a far worse idea. It's like the Virginia's eager but highly ineffective little cousin. Fifth cousin. Twice removed. But interestingly enough, the Hunley was a precursor of a new type of ship that would eventually redefine naval combat. It was a submarine. Man has always wished to do things he's told not to do. There's no motivator like being told no. Sometimes this results in harmless trivialities, like eating enough almonds that you find a few that aren't poisonous, or figuring out all the different places you can... I'm I'm not reading that. (laughs) (laughs) Or figuring out all the different places you can safely stick your dick. And that's how you can see the difference between between our writing. (laughs) But this drive also motivates man's desire to go places he just ain't meant to go. Humans have always flocked to the coastlines. The sea provides a bounty of food and later trade with other people. But men have legs. They go on land. If you want to go on the ocean, you invent a boat, which is just land that floats. And that serves us well enough. But then there are the truly deranged bastards that wish to go beneath the surface of the ocean, down into an alien pit that man was never intended to behold. These foolish mortals tread against the current of God and will thus incur his ornery wrath. This is something I fiercely believe in, Jay. The bottom of the ocean (laughs) is a strange alien hellscape and we are not supposed to go down there. Go- going down there leads to nothing but bad times and, and should purely be the uh, space of extrin- eccentric millionaires and uh, those with uh, far too little of a self-preservation instinct. Obviously, folks were diving as soon as they were swimming. 
By the time civilization settled on coastlines, humans were using spears to fish underwater and harvesting the shellfish that can be found in the shallows. With training, a fit adult can hold their breath for well over 10 minutes, but to stay down for longer, you're going to have to bring the air with you. A diving bell allows you to carry both a diver and a pocket of air down to the bottom of the sea, and then carry the two of them back up, if all goes well. Imagine a large bell, say 10 feet high, made of brass or wood, tied to a rope on a winch on the side of a ship. Inside the bell, maybe there's a bench for the diver to sit on, but the important part is that the water pressure of the ocean traps air inside of it. When you lower the bell straight down into the water, the water pressure will trap the air in the bell. If done properly, the bell won't fill with water, but instead the air that starts in the bell will stay in the bell, allowing you to essentially carry some of the Earth's atmosphere down to the bottom of the ocean. Diving bells were first mentioned by Aristotle in the 500s BC. We don't know how common they were in the medieval period, but we have a lot of records of their use starting around the 1600s. Inventors modified various designs of bells, improving them, and they were used to salvage ships and explore the ocean. You could haul up cannons using these things. They're really cool, but some wish to go further. Obviously, the bell is static. You can swim around the bell, but eventually you have to come back to the air. What if you could move the air around? D diving bells are dope. I did not know about them until I was like 18 or 20, and I was like, holy shit, this is like a really cool like medieval technology that, that is, is, is kind of dope. And I feel like we don't talk about enough. Like, I'm pretty sure most people's knowledge of diving bells only extends to that like one little scene in the first uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie where uh, they essentially turn a canoe into a diving bell for like one little scene. Uh, they, they, they are dope. You very much so. It's 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 like, well because they're just so clever. Like they're simple. Like there's not tons of like whirling gears and parts and technology. It, it's literally just a dome. Yeah. <laughs> but a dude can go like a hundred feet down and cruise in the 1600s. You know, salvaged whole ships. Brought up you know cannons that are very heavy using these things and cranes and winches and 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 ropes and whatnot. And it's incredibly clever for how, like, low-tech it, it was. Um, so you can find schematics and blueprints for what we might call a submarine as early as the 16th century. And we have no idea how many failed experiments there were into ill-conceived submersibles. People were taking a stab at the problem very early on. Now, by the 1800s, technology had progressed to the point where practical attempts were really being made. In 1775, a madcap dude named David Bushnell made several attempts at submersibles that were planned to affix explosives to British ships and the Revolutionary War, but this all failed. Uh, it was pretty cool, though, honestly. Uh, Robert Fulton worked on his Nautilus in the first few years of the 1800s, but that never became practical. Uh, and William Bauer did design a three-man sub in 1850. It was man-powered and went through several iterations before sinking the next year. Now, obviously, by the First World War, several technological innovations would have come about that would make submarines actually viable as weapons. Um, in no particular order, these include the self-propelled torpedo, which was first developed by the English inventor Robert Whitehead, in 1866 and would go on to become the dominant, you know, armament for submarines. Uh, as a note, you'll hear, you will hear the word torpedo um, perhaps later on in this episode, and sometimes if you're just reading about warfare even before 1866. Before then, torpedo basically just meant any sort of, like, explosive charge you're using in the water. <laughs> um, That's one of my favorite fun facts, is that the word, the t word torpedo predates the modern way we use torpedo. It used to just mean sea mine, like any explosive floating. The phrase, damn the torpedoes, which which some people might know, some people might not. This is like kind of the famous phrase using torpedoes. Does not refer to torpedoes the way we normally uh, conceive of them as like, you know, big uh, you know, cylindrical, you know, motorized things that, you know, one ship shoots at another and they explode. Yeah. 
The electric battery combined with the electric motor would be another important advancement. These would be first used on the Spanish submarine Peral in 1889. Uh, electric power provided for a simple and most importantly fumeless mode of propulsion for submarines when submerged. And finally, the internal combustion engine, which was first used on the USS Holland in 1900, would really be like the third major thing that would make submarines viable. The combination of running on electric propulsion when submerged, and then relying on a combustion engine for power and to recharge the batteries when surfaced, would become the norm on pretty much all submarines going forwards. You know, it wouldn't be until the invention of the nuclear submarine that, that would really change. And of course, there'd be other, you know, inventions that would come along, such as CO2 scrubbers, engine snorkels, more advanced pressure hulls, and so on and so forth. All of these would make submarines viable and safe. Our story, of course, takes place before any of these are invented. Which is why it is very fun, and on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the Hunley, it's a submarine. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how it was made. Uh, the Sun, the Hunley, first as a uh, just sort of uh, note, the Hunley goes by several different names. Uh, sometimes you'll see it listed as the CSS Hunley, Confederate State Ship. Other times you'll see it as the HL Hunley, or just the Hunley. This confusion is caused by the fact that the ship started as a private project, and while it was commandeered by the Confederates, it was never officially commissioned by the state. So it is not properly a confederate state ship uh, we, we will talk about how the Hunley was actually just kind of a bad cat project of some weirdos uh, later but it also seems to have only gotten the name the HL Hunley after its namesake died possibly after it sank for the final time during its construction it was called uh, the porpoise or the fish boat I was very frustrated, but in all of my research, I could actually not determine when it received the name the H.L. Hunley. Uh, I'm not sorry. Uh, fuck off. I, I'm doing my best. Now, the ship was named for its main financial backer and one of its engineers, Horace Lawson Hunley. That is a chud-ass name. I mean, remember, <laughs> while we're telling the story, all of these people are like Confederates fighting to enslave human beings, okay? You are not allowed to feel bad for any of them, though you will be tempted, because they will occasionally be very miserable over the course of this story, I promise you. Uh, but Horace Lawson Hunley uh, definitely sounds like a Confederate lawyer based out of New Orleans who got rich from sugar and cotton plantations. I couldn't find hard confirmation that he owned slaves, but let's just assume that he did because, you know, uh, New Orleans uh, sugar and cotton plantations. He is the rightfully doomed protagonist of this episode. Now, um, sources will talk about Hunley differently uh, depending on how accurate they are and there's some arguments a lot of them will call him like the sole engineer and genius behind the submarine that is definitely not true we, we can't exactly tell like who we all did what uh, but we do know kind of all who worked on it you have Baxter Watson Thomas Park Thomas Lyons all working on the project of different phases the main engineer was definitely a guy named James McClintock. He's the one who did all of the, the really hard work. Hunley may have done some of the engineering and designing, but uh, he was mainly the guy who provided the money and funding for the project. I would definitely, I'm comfortable calling McClintock the, the main genius, shall we say, behind this project. Now, Hunley and McClintock began work in New Orleans and in February of 62, tested their first prototype. You know, these guys are trying to solve this problem of the, uh, conf of the Union blockade of the Confederacy, and the Confederate states are offering very generous bounties for anyone who can uh, sink a Union ship. Again, they tested this prototype in February of 62. Uh, they called it the Pioneer, and they tested it in uh, Lake Pocantrain in the Mississippi River, but the Union advanced on New Orleans later that year, and the team scuttled their first ship to move to the port of Mobile, Alabama. Uh, 
In Mobile, the operation came under the direct supervision of the Confederate Army, though it wasn't really being taken too seriously. By January of 63, they had created a vessel called either American Diver or Pioneer II, depending on the source. This second attempt proved too slow to be practical and sank during a storm shortly after testing. This is already, we're already off to an amazing start. Yeah, great start. The H.L. Hunley was the third attempt at making a submarine, and it was the most successful of the bunch. You know, let's discuss how it worked. This ship was around 40 feet long and weighed a little less than 7 tons. It was made out of a cylindrical boiler, and inside, it was less than 4 feet wide and a little more than 4 feet tall. Of its 40 feet in length, about a third of that was taken up by two ballast tanks, one at the stern and one at the bow. We'll go into more detail as to the misery of the crew later, but suffice to say this vessel designed for eight people, and it's going to be cramped. The ship has a conning tower at either end with a porthole that allowed the crew to get in and out, reportedly with a lot of difficulty. For now, picture a cylinder that ends with a cone on either side and has two small round nums sticking out at the top. These 16 and a half inch wide portholes were the only way in and out of the ship, which doesn't inspire confidence in terms of escaping the thing in an emergency. There was glass at, at the top of the conning tower, allowing the captain to stand up in the back one and see where the ship was going. The ship got air through two snorkel tubes, and this is to me the funniest part of the death trap. Like, this thing is literally snorkeling. <laughs> this is a snorkeling machine, Jay. Yeah, I, snorkels will actually be used on like later like diesel electric subs during you know, by the time of the World Wars, but those would be like much more advanced and would mostly just feed air into the engine. And even then, like they didn't really work all that well a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, like like, like World War era subs were not great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're a luxury ocean liner compared to these things, but uh, the, even the best designed snorkel with like several different uh, redundant valves and whatnot, not the way I would want to get my air is all I'm saying. No. These tubes set flush to the ship most of the time, but when the crew requested air, they would be swiveled upwards 90 degrees. A valve would be opened, and the crewman in front of the captain would use a bellows to suck fresh air into the ship. And so, so again, this machine is called a submarine, but it doubtlessly spent most of its time above water and couldn't stay down for long. And when it was underwater, it wasn't far underwater, because... In order to get air, they, they've got to be pretty close to the And surface. that's, you know, to a lesser extent, really true for submarines all the way up until, like, late World War II. You know, even in the World Wars, submarines are going out on missions and spending most of their time on the surface and really only submerging to actually make, like, attack runs or to stalk a ship or something. They, you know, they just couldn't spend that, uh, uh, that much time underwater. Nuclear submarines are like properly like a different technology than submarines. They they yeah. work and they're used totally differently. Like if your main idea of what a submarine is comes from the hunt for Red October, this is going to be pretty different. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> most subs, not nuclear again. Yeah, they spend a lot of time near the surface uh, because that's where the fucking air is. Then came the problem of going down in the first place. If you place something in water, its weight pulls it down, and the water pushes it back up. That upward force is called buoyancy. Little physics lesson for you kiddies today. If you weigh less than the water, as in if the water exerts more force on you than you do on it, you have positive buoyancy and you float. Weigh more, and you'll exceed the water's upward force and have negative buoyancy. You sink. You know this. Now, the Hunley was made of metal obviously heavier than water, but filled with air, which was much lighter, and it floated on the surface of the ocean, much like an empty tin can. W w this stuff is all, like, elementary school basic, but what's really cool is, like, at this period in history, like, just a few years before this, 
your average person off the street did not think a metal ship would float. Uh, when, when the monitor, for example, like first demonstrated that, that it could float all on its own, it, it was on the surface of the ocean. It, it was an event, like it shocked people. Obviously, the math had, had worked out for centuries, but th this the, the so-called tin can principle was really only first being proven in like this decade of naval history yeah and, and you know the whole concept of just like letting in and out water to control your depth is still used today in submarines like that is you know that's how they work so jay just mentioned the ballast tanks that remember are in the front and back of the ship ballast is a naval term that means anything used to add weight to a ship uh, very funly, uh, ballast is sort of a uh, relative concept. And if you need to lose enough weight, well, anything can become ballast. <laughs> uh, the Hunley would let water into these ballast tanks to add weight to itself. You know, they would open a valve, you know, kind of, they would push a lever that would open a valve on both tanks and water would flow in. Now, obviously, those tanks started being full of air. As water filled those tanks, it would get heavier and the ship would sink. This process would have to be carefully controlled. If the tanks filled too quickly, the ship would sink to the bottom of the ocean and no one is going to have a good time. Uh, keep, keep that in, in the back of your mind, the ship going down too fast and the ballast tanks messing up. That will uh, come back later. A little bit of foreshadowing. Now, the captain in the back steered the ship as well as controlled these ballast tanks. The ballast tanks were originally filled with air, as mentioned, and when they wanted to descend, the captain would push down on the weaver. This weaver controlled dive planes, or fins, on the side of the ship. These fins would angle downward and control the ship's descent. At the same time, the ballast tanks would be opened at the bottom and water would rush in. The ballast tanks both had a valve at the top that connected to the center compartment. As the water pushed in, it pushed air from the tanks into the center compartment. A depth gauge and viewing ports were used to determine when to stop letting water in. Once the valves were shut, the tanks were only partially filled with water and the dive planes were leveled off. If done right, hopefully the ship would now be neutrally buoyant a few feet beneath the waves. If you're thinking to yourself, hey, if the ballast fills all the way with water, it could get into the crew compartment, that sounds bad. You're right. That would be very bad. This is like the oh shit part for me. Like, like if I'm in this thing, like this going down, uh, that is the part you absolutely do not want to fuck up. And determining like how far down to go and when to open and close the valves, like that's that's the stressful part. It goes down. By pumping water out of the ballast tanks and angling the dive planes upwards, the ship could hypothetically rise back out of the water. McQuintock also designed a way for the ship to rise quickly in case of an emergency by releasing iron ballast from its sides. Good idea. Wouldn't help, but good <laughs> idea. Yeah. Also, if you're a nautical history nerd who's gotten this far and is angry that we're calling it a ship instead of a boat, go fuck yourself. This podcast is for a casual audience, and we're trying to make this shit accessible. Go back to playing EVE Online. Jay won't admit it, but he does secretly love it when I write these episodes. <laughs> it's fun, yeah. Now, I, I bet some of y'all are wondering, like, how does this thing propel itself? Like, do they have, you know, there's no gas engines at this point in history. They're certainly not going to get a steam engine down there, anything this small, and... You're right. The Hunley was man-powered. <laughs> Seven of its eight crew members spent their time sitting on a wooden bench and cranking a massive drive shaft, which took up most of the compartment. This literal circle jerk of seven dudes propelled a propeller at the back, and the Hunley could reach a speed of almost five miles per hour while surfaced. Wow. <laughs> But this is a war vessel. How do we plan to sink another ship? 
Well, the plan was for the Hunley to literally drag a bomb behind it. So, we already mentioned that a uh, torpedo is an explosive that floats in the water at this point. The Hunley would drag a torpedo behind it with a 200-foot rope. The plan was for it to dive under a target and pull the torpedo into the enemy ship before speeding away. Spoiler alert, that idea will not go well. Before we uh, move on, we want to put this all together and illustrate how stupid and miserable this thing was. Like, a lot of people will talk about the Hunley as this brilliant and daring design. Just a new foray into technology, a pioneer, uh, breaking the barriers of what was possible. But, like, this is a stupid bad idea. And the thing was a depth trap. Uh... And I want to show y'all how stupid an idea it is. Let's put it all together. So, uh, also, a quote from someone who was actually on the Hunley, crewman William Alexander, testified that with the crankshaft taking up as much room as it did in the already small main cabin, quote, it was difficult to pass fore and aft, and with men in their places, it was next to impossible. So if you're in this thing... A giant crankshaft is like taking is like in your face the entire time. And when you're in your seat, you are staying in your seat as long as the ship is down. No potty breaks. Maybe p people have some snacks to to uh pass around. Uh maybe a piss bottle, but uh it's you 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 know best get comfortable. Yeah, you know, you have eight dudes stuffed in a cylinder that's about 21 feet long. Their heads are scraping against the ceiling, and they have to endlessly crank this massive drive shaft. They have to enter slowly through two portholes in the top, and once they're in place, they can't go anywhere. And, you know, they just have to constantly turn the drive shaft and quickly start breathing heavily and taking up the air. In order to get more ado, that's to control the snorkel to pump air into the cabin. They spend most of their time partially above the surface, so they can't see where they're going. They're just praying that they'll be so close to the water that no one will see them. Once they spot the ship, they have to dive down beneath it. And once they were submerged, the whole cabin was dark save for a candle that the captain is using to read the depth gauge. They would then use their best guesswork to dive under the enemy ship, drag a bomb into it, and then hopefully get away at a zippy 4 miles an hour. Their diving mechanism is slow and finicky, and also, if the ballast tanks fill, there will be water flooding the main compartment. The Hunley was a miserable nightmare to crew on top of its looming threat of death to anyone who touched it. Advocates will call it a daring innovation in nautical technology, but it was also a recklessly designed death trap. I do not want to pity Confederates, but the Hunley is, do, does test me on that front. Uh, this, this thing is fucking miserable. Moving on to its glorious voyages, uh, the Hunley bears the distinction of a naval vessel that sank three separate times, possibly more depending on how you count, but three separate times. That is a real accomplishment. Like, Jay, there is not a lot of ships that sank three separate times. You have to work for that designation. Yeah, like, off the top of my head, like, I can think of ships that would, you know, sunk at port, were then raised, and then sunk again, but I can't think of anything that was sunk three times <laughs> besides the Hunley. I'm sure if there's something out there, people will mention it in the comments or whatever. So in July of 1863, the Hunley successfully dived in Mobile Bay. I actually found a lot of conflicts and how successful this uh, test went in my sources. Uh, I'm Pretty sure it did not return to the surface by its own power, but this was good enough for the Confederates to ship it to Charleston to put it to military use. Uh, once in Charleston, South Carolina, there seems to have been a disagreement. You see, McClintock didn't have faith that his vessel could actually sink a Union ship as he knew that it barely worked, because he was the one who was designed it and seeing that it can't really surface under its own power. General Beauregard, who was in charge of Charleston, and you got, gotta love Southern Story, uh, ha having a guy named General Beauregard in it. Especially uh, because, like, his full name, if I'm remembering correctly, is PJT Beauregard. 
Yeah. He was a bit of a, so, bit of a uh, Napoleon nerd in that one. I mean, they all were at this point in history, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Napoleon was, was like two generations ago, and these guys, you know, masturbated to the, the idea of him like at, at night all the time. It's great. Uh, f- I mean, famously, future podcast uh, subject, uh, um, George, what's his fucking name, Jay? Uh, McClellan? Dumbass. Yeah, George McKellen. Didn't that guy that fashioned himself like the new oh, Napoleon? Yeah. <laughs> and Very much was so. so terrified to lose a battle that he essentially did nothing the entire war. Yeah, I guess Beauregard at least was like French. So they were both, you know, like French Louisiana. And so he had at least some claim to it. <laughs> yeah, so this guy, he's in charge of Charleston. He wants to use uh, the, hunt, the, the, sh- the ship. So... He uh, sacks McClintock and turned the ship over to the Confederate Navy. Uh, Lieutenant Payne volunteered to captain her and was joined by seven crewmen from other ships. In all my research, I have never found anyone with a rank higher than lieutenant uh, being uh, on the Hunley. And while lieutenant is a little higher of a designation in naval terms rather than in army terms, it still ain't that high. And I think that says something, folks. You, you don't you don't get to be a captain or an admiral by uh, by stepping foot in DHL Hunley. <laughs> uh, only fast track the Hunleys to is to the bottom of uh, the Bay of Charleston. But Payne, who's again probably a twenty something dumbass, uh, volunteers to captain her and is joined by seven crewmen from some of our local ships. After a few days of surface tests, Payne was confident in his ability, and they set a dive test date for the August 29th of 63. The crew dived down successfully, but Payne ran into problems while surfacing. There are conflicting reports on what happened, but the most common argument is that Payne got tangled in like all of the levers and, and rudders and whatnot that he had as uh, the captain. They, they had gotten like right to the surface of the water and as he's like trying to get out he essentially trips and hits a lever that he's not supposed to and this accidentally makes the ship die with his hatches open it took on water and drowned five of its crewmen so that's one sinking and five deaths on the scoreboard uh, pain is relieved of duty yeah and I guess this also briefly harkens back to when we were talking about, you know, the, the innovations which would make submarines somewhat decent. Uh, one of those, which I didn't mention, would be, you know, electric lighting. Because <laughs> this thing, all this guy's got is a candle, and he has to operate, like, Just a, a lot of machinery. <laughs> like, needless to say, you know, having actual light bulbs would have would have probably been quite a benefit. Helped out. Now, the vessel was raised, but the Confederates had trouble finding a crew that wanted to get into this death trap, uh, quite understandably. Every source that I saw mentions that they had a really hard time <laughs> finding uh, so, uh, people to actually get in this thing, for yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. Hunley, and this is being the man, not the submarine, was convinced that the crew was just handling the vessel improperly and traveled to Charleston to train a crew himself. Hunley with Captain. Okay, so we're on the up and up. This is the, the the guy who, if he wasn't even the main engineer, he did some of the engineering, and he's been with this ship the entire time. He he knows it. Surely this dude's gonna have a better record than our twenty something dumbass lieutenant. <laughs> well, let's see. Hunley would captain the ship for its next voyage on October fifteenth. The crew was aiming to successfully dive under a ship and resurface. The mock enemy in this test would be the Indian chief which would stay stationary during the test. Hunley and the crew dived with the ship that would soon bear his name, but never surfaced. Air bubbles rose shortly after it descended, suggesting a sudden loss of air. The second sinking would claim the lives of all eight inside, including Hunley. At this point, General Beauregard was ready to scrap the program, but Lieutenant George Dixon, who had participated in some of the early tests, convinced him to resurrect the ship. During Dixon's test voyage, he determined that the rope that pulled the torpedo had a tendency to get caught up in the propeller, 
With this in mind, he changed to Hunley's armament. The charge would now be attached to a 22-foot wooden spar that was mounted on the Hunley's bow. The plan was now for the Hunley to literally run an explosive lance into its opponent. This is what I fucking love, Jay. This is where we just get into the absolute redneck shit. Like... We're just going to put a bomb on a stick and we're just going to poke them with it and they're going to explode. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best. It's the fucking best. The shitty explosive we're gonna narwhal. We're going to poke them with an explosive stick underwater. Yes, we're a fucking narwhal. We're not just a fish boat. We are a narwhal boat. I, I wasn't able to do as much research into Dixon as I wanted to, but I, I he's another lieutenant, and I get the sense that he's kind of a nut. <laughs> uh, he, he spends more time with this ship than anybody before, um, and actually gets pretty decent results uh, from it, at least compared to what we've seen before. Uh, you know, Hunley himself couldn't yeah. survive a single... Uh, <laughs> test voyage dixon actually well he surfaces okay that counts for something he is able to go down and come back up uh fever and his cat but but he and his crew of seven dudes really just strike me as just like some oddball um misfits that the confederates don't really care about and beauregard's like all right fine get the fuck out of my face go deal with the hunley whatever i don't care um, so Dixon would test his ship carefully, and he managed to stay underwater for two and a half hours at one point, which is actually more than I thought they would be able to manage. I, I, that That's not nothing. His aim was to sink the Union ships blockading the Charleston Harbor. Th these tests go on for months, and uh, during all of this, the Union gets wind of Dixon's plans probably through either spies or deserters, they knew that a Confederate submersible was coming, and they stationed Ironside ships near the harbor's entrance. That would be harder damage. Dixon then decides to aim for the smaller wooden ship that was farther out to sea. Uh, remember, at this point, the uh, Hunley has done all of its tests in, you know, the Mississippi Lake and uh, the shallows of a harbor. It, it has never gone out to open sea before. But on February the 17th of 1864, the Hunley left port for the final time. I'm going to thicken my accent for this. Its target was the USS Housatonic, which is a really stupid name. <laughs> <laughs> which sat about five miles off the coast. I have allowed Jay to explain uh, what the Housatonic was as he is the resident naval nerd. Thank you. Now, the Housatonic was a screw sloop launched in 1861. She had a length of 205 feet, a beam of 38 feet, and a displacement of 1,260 tons. Like most warships of the era, Housatonic relied on both sails, in this case three masts, and a steam engine capable of propelling her up to a speed of nine knots. Housatonic was armed with a single large 100-pounder parrot rifle, three 30-pounder parrot rifles, and an assortment of smaller smoothbore guns. For context, a parrot rifle is basically a, a rifled, muzzle-loading cannon, so Unlike a lot of previous naval cannons, it's actually decently accurate. It is rifled, but you're still loading it through the front of the gun. The term sloop of war had been in use since the earlier days of the Age of Sail, and sloop typically referred to ships that carried 18 or fewer guns on a single gun deck. This made them smaller than frigates and ships of the line, but larger than cutters or schooners. While screw sloops such as the USS Housatonic would have been considered mid-size at most by European standards. They were generally among the larger warships used by either side of the Civil War in substantial numbers. You know, the Union would make some new, like, big ironclads, like, one of them is literally called the USS New Ironsides, and that's, like, I think, like, 8,000-ton displacement, much bigger than Housatonic. But, but these swoops are kind of like the bread and butter of the, of the Union fleet, so to speak. It's a very, like, standard type of ship. 
ironclads at this point are actually moving very quickly in leaps and strides every year, uh, but they are still very expensive and unwieldy. Uh, yeah. The Housatonic is a much more conventional ship, even though it has a steam engine on it. It's still like, like if you picture like a you know, Pirates of the Caribbean ship, you, it's it's going to look more or less like that. Uh, so this is kind of old style versus new style. We're going to have a showdown. Yeah. The Hunley approached under the water in cover of night and surfaced about 300 yards from its target to properly align itself. Um, all sailing did at this point in history, but you got to remember, controlling this thing it involved a lot of guesswork. As a guy who's uh, captains uh, some small sailboats myself, I do not uh, envy these folks. Around 8.45 p.m., the crew of the Housatanic spotted a strange black vessel coming towards them, and after wondering if it was a porpoise, they figured it was the Confederate sub they had been told to keep an eye out for. At this point, however, the Hunley was far too close for the Housatanic's guns to aim downwards and stop it. The crew fired on the sub with muskets and shotguns, but that did not stop the Hunley from driving its spar torpedo into the Housatonic. Success! The resulting explosion would sink the Housatonic and kill five of her crew of 150. Uh, they, those guys would be... Remember, this is a blockade. There's lots of ships around, and those uh, guys would all be rescued by uh, the nearby Union vessels. Now, Wikipedia chalks this up as a Confederate victory. A designation I find to be highly generous. <laughs> the Hunley never returned from this mission, and for years there was much debate as to how long it survived after its attack. Uh, many were convinced that it just barely made it to port, which, you know, adds suspense to the tale. Uh, the Hunley was eventually found off of the coast of Charleston, and it was raised from the ocean floor in 2000. The story of its discovery contains a bit of mishap and controversy that's too boring to go into, and the ship now sits in the museum. Like, we have the Hunley. We have recovered it. Um... Study of its remains confirms a theory that the more scientifically literate amongst you were probably thinking about from the moment I mentioned uh, that exploding lance. Now, explosions are a shock wave, a pressure wave. A pressure wave is just a displacement of a medium. The density of that medium determines the power of the wave. Detonate the same explosive in air and in water, and the one detonated in water will create a far more powerful shock wave because water is heavier than air. Anyway, this is all to say that upon contacting with the Housatanic, the Hunley's explosives detonated and the resulting shock wave almost certainly ripped through the Hunley and killed everyone in it instantly. Just... And, like, tons of people argued against this for years because they wanted to tell this, like, romantic story about the Hunley, you know being successful and going back in and you being caught in the bad tides and being further out to sea than it never been before and struggling to get to the surface but then sinking down and like listen if you have sympathies with these guys which again you shouldn't they're confederates they're bad fuck them isn't it nicer to imagine that they all died suddenly and without warning like painlessly and they did not drown I find drowning to death to be a terrifying idea. Like, uh, I have to admit that radiation, severe radiation poisoning is probably worse, but, like, drowning to death is, in my opinion, the worst way to die, conventional way to die. Like, like it, I've been, like, pretty far underwater. I've, I've swam down, like, 20, 30 feet. I've, I've been trapped underwater by a sail before when my boat capsized. I, I have, you know, had... <laughs> struggles to get up. I know what it's like to be running out of air and moving faster through the water than you ever thought you could to just reach the surface. Uh, drowning terrifies me. Uh, and if the, you know, the guy's skulls all cracked when a pressure wave ripped through their cabin, they didn't have to deal with that. 
It's fine. It's great. It's way better. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny also when you, uh, if you're familiar with submarine warfare during the World Wars, the main weapon that was used against submarines by surface ships was something called a depth charge. A depth charge is essentially just a bomb that you drop into the water. Um, you basically set it to explode at a certain depth. And, you know, if you drop it near the submarine and guess correctly how deep it is, it'll explode nearby and the shock wave will break the submarine. And depth charges were effective because you didn't have to get a direct hit. You just had to have a big enough explosion somewhere near the submarine. And basically the Hunley's weapon is a depth charge. <laughs> they are exploding a, a charge At next to themselves. Feet from their nose. <laughs> yeah. It's they, they 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 fucking go through all this work. They spend hours in misery, misery in this cramped compartment where they can't see anything, and they're constantly cranking this shaft, and their muscles are aching, and their butt is sore, and their legs are numb, and then they just they just fucking blow themselves up. Yeah. In in, in their moment of glory. Uh. We go with this theory because it is the funniest, but we can't know for sure. You know, they might have survived afterwards and then been lost to the tides and, and sunk. You know, as we've laid out, the Huntley had plenty of technical problems and, and, and plenty of flaws, and there's myriad different ways it could have malfunctioned and sank after this. Inspection of the dead remains do not show massive damage to the skeletons, but there's also no sign they tried to escape. Uh, smart money is they were knocked out by the explosion. Again, maybe their skulls you know, were fractured or they had some internal bleeding or hemorrhaging or whatever. Anyway, they drowned while they were unconscious. Uh, the Hunley's official museum plays up the mystery of the sinking with various different theories and even lets you vote on which one you, you like. You know, it's, all, it's all kitschy and you know, kid shit. But I'm pretty confident in saying the explosion killed the crew. Again, even if it hadn't killed the crew, they could have easily died in the return voyage because not exactly a reliable vessel. Uh, it's just amazing that you have this thing that is already a death trap. And then the last guy, George Dixon, the scion who's going to make this thing work, his, his big innovation is to, okay, diving super deep and dragging this bomb behind us. That's a stupid idea. And he makes the Hunley into even more of a suicide <laughs> mission. No one is competent. It's beautiful. The Hunley successfully sank the Housatanic, but this killed more of its own crew than the Union sailors on that ship, and did not allow the Confederates to break the naval blockade of Charleston. So far off... It sank so far off the shore, the Confederates could not salvage the vessel, and the final KDA of the Hunley would be 5210, which I think we can all agree is pretty fucking embarrassing. Today, the Hunley rests at the Warren Lash Conservation Center, and you can go see it if you want. I advise exercising caution around several museums. Uh, you might get fed some bullshit. The written part of the podcast is now over, but I kind of wanted to end this, Jay, with you and I kind of going into sort of more of a freeform discussion about the Hunley. Um... You know, I knew going into this episode that I was going to make it sound silly and make it sound stupid. This is no one is competent, and personally, I don't want to glorify Confederates. I want, you know, wanted to point out that this is a mechanically flawed, flawed death trap. But you can make an argument that the Hunley is cool, right? It's steampunk, that it was the most advanced submarine vessel at in the world of the human race at the time when it was invented and in many ways you can argue it was very successful it did kill some union soldiers uh it did kind of work so you yeah. know, how do we feel about the hunley success failure you know where, where does it set for you so you know for me i've always been exposed to the hunley you know in media that that always just accredits it as you know the first successful use of a submarine in warfare um and that certainly should be an accomplishment right 
to me, it sort of gets into the question of, you know, technology and technology's role in warfare and how people today sometimes have a tendency to just view the advance of, of technology in warfare and in other fields as like the main thing people are trying to do. Yeah, the, the point of history is to increase in progress. Yeah, and it's like... Th that's a huge fallacy that runs our world these days. I mean, like, if you play the video game Civilization, like, literally the point is to go through the various... Uh, is to increase your technological prowess. Yeah, and, and it's like definitely from... definitely a very modern historical bias. Yeah, and from that perspective, you know, the Hanoi is one stop in the tech tree that would lead towards you know, nuclear submarines or whatever. Now, that itself is debatable. I think there was enough yeah, interest no, in submarines around the world. Like, there are a lot of people in Europe thinking about submarines. If the Hunley never existed, submarines would still exist. <laughs> you know, somebody yeah, else would have done it. probably... Ha I don't... Th I, I, I didn't really research this, but... I mean, the Spanish did get uh, a certain... A, a, submarine working just a few years after yes, this yeah. to a certain uh, d degree and i don't think this thing was really studied again it, it you know it, it sank far enough you know to the ocean that no one yeah, was no, able to, to my, study it for a long time to and, my knowledge uh, it had no real impact and certainly not in terms of like the design of of future submarines I would say the fact that you know the general layout the general mechanism in the broadest terms does resemble what would be used in future submarines is commendable for the designers, you know, for McClintock and, and whatever. And I would say that if the Hunley had existed as just like a peacetime thought experiment or like a prototype that you test out, see if it works, you know, go from there, I think there would be, you know, some credit to it. But but my point. Yeah, this thing started as like a rich weirdo funding his his buddy's science project in the backyard lake. Yeah, but you know, and that's what it might have been. Hunley, the guy, his I don't think his goal was to make a death trap that would then be remembered as you know one step along the line that would result in German submarines sinking Atlantic convoys in 1917. That's not what he was going for. What Hunley was trying to do was to make something to end the Union blockade of the South, or at least to reduce the Union blockade of the South. And from that perspective, it failed miserably. And, you know, like, a lot of times people use the term ahead of its time. You know, we'll talk about a lot yeah. of, like, German weapons in the Second World War are ahead of their time. You know, the V-1 and the V-2 rockets were certainly ahead of their time if you think that from a theoretical perspective, cruise missiles and intercontinental ballistic missiles would become very big only a few years after World War II. But at the time themselves, they didn't, didn't accomplish... Exactly help them yeah. win the war. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Scoreboard! Scoreboard! Look at the fucking scoreboard! Yeah. That's like, Lost cause bullshit the, the, all the way down. Yeah, the people designing them were not, again, not thinking, like, this is important because, you know... Other people will use this technology in the future. They're thinking this is important because this will win us the war, and it, it didn't. And I think from that perspective, yeah, like, like yeah, the, the Hunley, I think, is it is a failure. It's a failure that had some good ideas and, you know, could have been done better um, with a different approach. But, you know, they didn't take that different approach. It. What's interesting... There's a lot of people who are going to learn that the Hunley existed by reading, like, say, a Wikipedia article on submarines, and they're going to see it as, like, a list of attempted submarines, along with the German one in 1850 and, like, the Spanish one in 1868, and they're going to see, oh, that's really cool. And it is very interesting that when you look, the you know, for the historical record that, you know, will exist for as long as mankind is writing things down, the first uh the first killing of a person by a submarine belongs to the confederate states of america that that is weird and that is is definitely noteworthy i mean the confederacy was a fucking shambling 
barely held together uh, failed economy at that point in 64. But, you know, the United States was becoming a more powerful nation at that point, surely. But the U.S. was 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 still more or less a technological backwater. Um, This is part of what makes naval warfare in the Civil War so interesting, because the Civil War would see America kind of very briefly uh, surge ahead of uh, the rest of the world. And, and, and even then, uh, like, it was a short leave time. Like, the Confederates were purchasing a warship from, built by the French during the war. Um, it would be, um, you know, uh, I'm forgetting its name. I think it was going to be called Stonewall, but it never saw service. And, you know, had it been delivered during the war, it would have been better than any Union warship because the French and the British had already gone far ahead of what the what the Union was developing. Uh, but the war ended before it could be delivered. It ended up in Japan, actually, and uh, would be named the Kotetsu. But, yeah, it's like you have in the Civil War both sides experimenting a lot in, in some very interesting ways. I mean, you get things like the Gatling gun. You get the first widespread use of revolvers um, and lever action rifles, even. And it's worth mentioning that the Union themselves had their own attempt at the uh, submarine, the Alligator. It, it got oh, yeah. even. I, I didn't really look that far into it, but it, I, my understanding is it is it uh, got even less far than Hunley did. Yeah. Yeah, there was that the real Civil sense War of is experimentation weird... that like provides you know some of the context for why this even existed in the first place. Middle of the 18th century Civil War period, a lot of technological innovations spurred by war are uh, um, happening very quickly. And those technological innovations are sharpened in our minds by how, at the same time, war is so anarchist, anarchist, anarch, old style in this period. Uh, if you study Civil War battles, you'll find, especially many Confederate soldiers that didn't have a gun and are literally just fighting with a rock they picked up uh, off the ground. Uh, tons of this is a war that starts with armies shooting at each other with you know, mus with with, with uh, musket lines, the and unrifled guns, the same way they had in the Revolutionary period, and it ends with close to, you know, with, with fucking Gatling guns and revolvers and shit. Uh, and that's, you know, right next to people on horseback with fucking cavalry sabers. Uh, you have these ironclad steam-powered ships right next to sail-powered ships that look like they're right out of a fucking, you know, grand age of sail, fucking golden age of piracy shit. So... That uh, sort of lag time of the technology being implemented definitely heightens the technology innovations that do exist. Yeah, it was very much, you know, this conflict, you know, the Crimean War, which is a little bit earlier, and like going through like the Franco-Prussian War, like these are very transitional wars um, between, you know, the Napoleonic era and a lot of you know, the failures of leaders during the American Civil War can be partially attributed to the fact that, you know, most of them all went to West Point and studied war the way it was fought under Napoleon. And that's kind of what they were what they were going off of. And things had changed, not entirely, but partially. And Oh, the, yeah. The, the U.S. Civil War, uh, I, it, I'm pretty sure it doesn't invent, but Fucking trench warfare. Tons of trench warfare uh, oh, between yeah. Virginia and D.C. If yes. you wanted to get a preview of what World War One was going to look like, the American Civil War fucking showed you. The, the other thing with the Hunley, like, if I have to list what is most impressive about it to me, it, it is that it could successfully, with a bunch of fucking valves and levers being operated by candlelight, dive and then come back with, with fucking fins on the side of it really like we they're called dive planes but people call it a fish boat because it looked like a fucking fish it has fins on the side of it uh so, so that is relatively cool the fucking hand crate 
shaft is is, is lame as hell, <laughs> you know. But uh, even they didn't think that trying to put a a steam engine down there no. would be a good idea. <laughs> no, you'd have to wait for Someone, a little bit longer. The, the British tried that, right? <laughs> yes, they did. And how did that go for him, Jay? And not well. <laughs> Some of the worst submarines uh, uh, ever made, and like it, from the time period when submarines actually started being dis- decent. Yeah, and as we've said, submarines, even when they started working in World War One and World War Two, there were still a lot of death traps. Uh, in, in my understanding, in World War Two, there were a lot of submarines that essentially sank themselves. Oh uh, yeah, on, on both sides, and and fucked up. Uh, submarines today are still pretty. No, you go. Uh, American submarines were, at least relative to their foreign peers, relatively comfortable by the time of World War II. Uh, but unfortunately, the American torpedoes in the start of the war were had an unfortunate tendency to loop backwards and hit the thing that was firing them. <laughs> so We would cover this, but there is a Lions Led by Donkeys yeah. episode about uh, these torpedoes please look them up uh it is absolutely i because I, I i had it in a vague but, but jay just reminded me it is fucking hilarious how many of yeah. uh, uh they, they, uh u.s navy submarines fucking sank themselves by their own uh torpedoes hitting them and also like the the process of these guys figuring out that the torpedo did this on occasion and trying to like take advantage of it and change the meta around it uh, as a really interesting yeah, story like German submarines you know and the Germans would be the most famous for their submarine use of any of the nations in both world wars uh, but serving on a German submarine was miserable and it had an atrocious death rate like and this was World War One before you even had the meth. Yeah. I mean, even in World War II, again, like, a really poor survival rate. Like, if you had the choice of being sent to the front lines to fight as a regular grunt or getting in a submarine, being sent to the front lines, you had a much better chance of surviving. Um, I think it was like... That is saying something. Wow. One of the wow. deadliest... We've covered <laughs> Stalingrad on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's like... That is... That's saying something. It's one of the deadliest jobs alongside like being like the tail gunner on a bomber or something like that. It was not a not a fun career. Yeah, we talked about how the Hunley gets sort of recontextualized as this one step towards uh, the, the march of progress towards submarines, and that kind of glorifies it. A lot of people glorify it for the tale of it all, and you know, I... I put a lot of tension and good storytelling into the tale i think it's a uh you can definitely get something out of it it, it definitely like like this, this thing even in its most successful iteration this, this was never going to fucking turn the tide of the war at this point in 64 no. like maybe very like if, if they had had some incredible success in 62 and made like a dozen of these things and they each successfully sank a ship a, a ship or two like then we're talking but like most writers won't want to admit, but this thing was a fucking, basically a hobby project. Again, this was never officially christened as a Confederate state ship. Um, when I uh, started this document, I titled it the CSS Hunley, because I thought it was a Z- I had heard it was CSS Hunley, but this episode is the HL Hunley, because the, it's, a fuck, it's basically a civilian mess- vessel crewed by uh, military sailors, and... It was really just the fucking eccentric hobby horse of uh, one guy, uh, fucking redneck dumbass, who was sent on a suicide mission, as many a redneck dumbass is. And, you know, I gotta fucking salute him on that. Yeah. Just imagine. Like, I have been on... And I can conceptualize this. Because, you know, this compartment's around 21 feet long. I have been on a 15-foot ship. I've been on a 30-foot sailboat uh, i i know how what, like like you know how much room you have to move around in those kinds of uh apartments and with enough people you can go pretty fucking stir crazy they're easy enough eight people in a like 25 to 20 foot main compartment 
Yeah, that is way too fucking many. That is way too cramped. Uh, it's just how absolutely, and, and your muscles, because you're just cranking this shaft. You're cranking this shaft. Just these poor bastards. Any other thoughts? Uh, no, I think that summarizes about it. Yeah, fun episode. Got to do some good old his, uh, historical materialism on why the Civil War started. Uh, fascists, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I will uh, redact it, redact it, redact it, and it'll be over. This has been the No One Is Competent podcast. Please give us some love. Give us some back on whatever app you are listening to us. If you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, rate, review, any system that you can interface on the interface that you are looking at of the podcasting uh, place you are listening to and consuming the podcast straight into your ear holes. Interface with it. Spread the ooze by the podcast. I have been Azalea. I am joined by Jay, and we hope no matter where you are in the world, that y'all be good.